For people who are joining us again, my name is Ali Vichelli. I'm a junior partner here at King Law Offices. And my name is Marty Wallace. I'm also a junior partner here at King Law. Today we're going to discuss what happens when you have a loved one who is not really thinking like they used to, possibly making some odd decisions or actions in their life, and you're thinking that maybe it might be time to consider a guardianship or hopefully they had a power of attorney and that someone that they trusted could take over some of their obligations or things that would help them as their as a person take care of themselves. Today we're not really going to talk so much about powers of attorney but more about the guardianship aspect of it and what needs to happen. The first thing here in North Carolina we recommend is getting an attorney because you could make a mistake <laughs> and it could be one that you can't really turn back from. Right? And it's it's not an easy thing to say, you know, mom can't make decisions for herself anymore. Dad is, you know, sending money to people he shouldn't be sending money to and I'm really worried about him. It's a really hard thing to step into and even with siblings I've had a lot of clients who you know my sibling is just not able to you know think straight anymore. Um, so without powers of attorney here in North Carolina um, you have to file for what's called incompetency and guardianship and it's technically a two-stage kind of hearing but usually happens all at once, but we're going to kind of divide it up the way the law thinks about it and the way we think about it. Um, so the first would be a determination of incompetence and not my favorite word. Um, you know, lack of capacity is preferable for me, but the law uses incompetence as a, a legal term of art. So right. when we say that, we're not well, no, trying to be archaic or... What I tell <laughs> my though. clients is... I, there's a lot of things that I am totally incompetent doing. Doing a heart surgery would be one of them. And uh, I don't want to have myself labeled as incompetent. We all have our incompetences, but this this does the bars a little bit higher on this. And um, what I like about North Carolina is it, it's, a, it's a pretty form-driven mm -hmm. process, but there are certain strategies that we employ mm -hmm. in the very beginning that we sort of save some things for the hearing and you need to know what those things are and why we do that. Um, but the first, the first step is to get that, uh, you, you apply or petition the court for the adjudication of incompetency and application of guardianship. Right. So there's a hearing where you're asking the court to say that your loved one or the respondent, the per because technically you are filing a lawsuit against the person, um, to have the court say that they can't make decisions for themselves anymore, um, that they may, may meet a legal standard of um, not being able to you know, contracts for things, um, you know, make good decisions for themselves. And it comes up in a lot of different ways. We see incompetence present itself a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's combativeness. Um, you know, sometimes the individual won't get help, won't seek medical treatment. I don't need to take that medication. I don't need to pay that bill. It, it can be very combative. Some fails, I think, is one of the first red flags that people aren't constantly in that person's life right and so sometimes it becomes combative i don't owe that i don't have to do that i don't need to take that these doctors don't know what they're talking about um and sometimes it just presents itself as apathy and forgetting right. just oh i didn't know i had to pay that um had a individual who thought their tv had broken because they couldn't get it they couldn't get the satellite 
system to turn on. Turns out they hadn't paid their satellite bill in a few months. And on that note, one of the things you can do to get ahead of the curve a little bit, even before calling an attorney, is when you, if you go to the doctor with the person in need of guardianship, you could speak with the doctor about that, uh, that what you might be thinking of doing and ask them if they would be amenable to signing a medical affidavit giving their um, recommendation that this person does get a guardianship in place because they're no longer able to care for themselves or communicate their wishes about their health care any longer. That helps a lot. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some counties here in North Carolina that if you don't have a medical affidavit, they'll continue your hearing until you get one. Right. And there's a lot of different things like that. And just the level, the legal standard for um, incapacity and incompetence. And that's why we say come speak to an attorney. It's not because we're trying to drive the ship. It's because the standard is so high. You can think someone doesn't have capacity, and then you speak to a lawyer and you say, well, in this county, that this clerk's office is not going to find that they're incompetent. And, it's just not going to happen. And you want it that way. That's not anything that you don't want, because what we're essentially doing is we're taking away U.S. constitutional rights to freedom of uh, being able to be independent and have your own thoughts, make your own decisions. Um, those types of things, they're serious. And I think in those counties where they're careful about that. I like that because I wouldn't want someone trying to get that over me if it really wasn't warranted. And we always, always look at the least restrictive mechanism so that the person in need of guardianship, so that their quality of life is maintained and that they're safe with the least restrictive measure. Maybe a guardianship really isn't what we should be looking at right now. And so having an attorney that gets a feel for those types of hearings, they know. I Sometimes I feel like I'm, this is not going to go. Right. You just, you understand what's happening. And sometimes it's, fa sometimes it comes in with family squabbles. Well, you know, my sister is power of attorney over my dad. And she said, I can't talk to dad. Well, is dad in such a state where, you know, he believes that our potential client is somebody else who he has animosity toward? And that so sister's just saying, hey, I think it's better for him if you stay away from for a little while. Or is it genuinely something that's a problem? Is something going on? Right. Um, you know, and the less restrictive alternatives, I think our office has been doing that for years, trying to come up with something. As of January of 2024, that's not a legal requirement. You have to explore less restrictive alternatives before you can file for guardianship. So when we say talk to an attorney, sometimes that's also why. A lot of times that's also why. That's a legal standard. You've got to try first. If the attorney says this person is too far gone or there's no way we can try something else, then you know for sure that guardianship is the way to go. Right. Another thing to get ahead of the curve before you even think about guardianship. If you do, like, let's say it's mom or dad uh, and you have siblings. It is always a good idea to, for the people that are interested in becoming guardian over mom or dad. I usually say, unless you're like get along exceptionally well, <laughs> no co-guardians, just have one person be the, the go you know, the, the person who does everything, but still talks with the family about what, what, what should I do here for mom? Cause you guys know mom the best when you have two siblings or any type of family member, they both want guardianship over mom or dad or, or whoever it is. And they're not getting along. You run a big risk. You walk into that courtroom. Maybe neither one of you are going to get it. But they're going to get adjudicated incompetent. Now what do we do? DSS. That's what we do. And DSS might be a great option for some, but they don't have the time to look after mom or dad like some a loved one. That's, right. Those, I think, are the, the biggest tips when you're thinking about right. guardianship. DSS, uh, another third party. There are different um, organizations that will step in, but they also won't step in over finances. So then you run the risk of... If your loved one needs help with their finances and needs someone to take over their finances, who's that going to be? 
Um, you know, is it going to be an attorney in the area? Is it going to be a financial institution? There's just a lot of unknowns when there's family squabble. So if you truly really care about this person, you're going to get along with the others, both of you or whoever it is, you're going to take that initiative to let bygones be bygones and let's get this person help. So taking into consideration all the, the things to think about with, you know, conversations with family, you know, avoiding what we call third party guardianships, things like that. When you talk about moving forward with an incompetency proceeding. Marty had mentioned the name of the form. It's a petition for adjudication of incompetence. Um, you know, it's filling out names, addresses, everything that needs to be included, including where someone has lived for the last 12 months, including any hospital stays, rehab stays, things like that. You have to put all of it down. And the court isn't looking for you to, you know, admit any kind of neglect or abuse or something right. like that. They're really just trying to make sure that that county has proper jurisdiction to hear the case. So, you know, if mom had been living in Polk County for her entire life, let's just use that as an example. She lived in Tryon her entire life, but now she's in a facility in Henderson County Polk County is not the proper place to file this guardianship proceeding, this incompetency proceeding. You got to go to Henderson County. And so that's why you got to talk about that kind of stuff. Um, and then part of the petition is also listing all of the next of kin, which can include that sibling that you don't necessarily want to know what's going on or that's estranged that you might not have an address for. You gotta list them, unfortunately, and it can be kind of awkward. Because again, we're taking away rights and the court wants to hear from everybody, good, bad, indifferent. And in my experience, they can see through the BS. Right. They know if someone's a bad actor. And having an attorney, attorneys know what to say to help the court understand that. Mm -hmm. You know, Miss Betty hasn't had a relationship with her child, this child in a few years now. They know, okay, so this one doesn't know what's going on. Or, you know, sometimes it's a case where Miss Betty's been paying little Bobby's bills and <laughs> little Bobby wants to be the guardian so he can make sure his bills keep getting paid. Right. And, and then also you're going to want to think about what kind of guardianship do we want? There's a couple different kinds. You can, well, there's three main kinds. You can have a guardian of the person, which is just over the person, no financial aspects involved. The guardian of the estate, which is all the financial and uh, ownership of property, those types of things. And then those two put together are called, is called general guardianship. And you can even have limited guardianship. If you have somebody who they can do some things, we want to allow that. And that gets into that least restrictive, uh, type of guardianship so we can limit it and then we can actually define what the, what what the guardian is really going to help with and part of this whole process is thinking about what is best for my loved one what you know what is best for mom what is best for dad and we say mom and dad because usually that's what we see happen so you know what is best for mom isn't necessarily the level of control that some people want, but we're not talking about control here. We're talking about assistance and help. Right. So that's something that, you know, you kind of have to think about. You're not getting this to be in control. You're getting this to help. And so if you come at it from that angle, understanding why limited guardianships will occur and why the court might say, you really need to talk to mom or dad before you move them into a facility, before you agree to some kind of aggressive form of treatment for something. Mm -hmm. They need to know what's going on. You have the final say as a guardian of the person or a general guardian over that treatment. But again, you don't want to take every autonomy, every bit of autonomy someone has. Another thing that I if I can at all <laughs> finagle it, where my client, the petitioner, who's trying to get guardianship, if I can at all remove the guardian of the estate completely from mm -hmm. the picture, like if mom's just receiving um, Social Security administration funds and not any other funds, and we're looking at potentially, uh, well, actually for that, 
you know, I'm, I just tell them, you know, getting rep payee status from Social Security is a lot easier to handle as far as what the, the accounting responsibilities are for the year than a guardian of the estate. It is, uh, it borders on nightmare level. <laughs> You don't want to do it if you can at all get away from it. Right. And we're going to have a whole video on guardianships of the estate and what to look at. Because sometimes they really are necessary. But if you have an attorney that's sitting here saying, let's think about other ways to do this. It's not because they're trying to say you aren't responsible or you shouldn't do this. It's, it's more the accounting requirements and the limitations as a guardian that you have to spend funds. They're what you they're not what you would expect they're very stringent and very strict and it it's you, court oversight yeah. of this person's money and it's exactly how you would want it if you had a guardian it's awful <laughs> <laughs> so that's something to consider um part of the petition for adjudication of incompetence also includes a capacity questionnaire this is a good and it's a good time to sit and think okay Honestly, removing the emotion from something and answering the questions. There are things like, can this person take care of their personal hygiene? And you say, well, yeah, every once in a while, mom will go to the bathroom or, you know, I'll have to remind her to shower, but she can shower on her own. If she's not, if mom is not regularly showering, and it doesn't mean every single day or twice right. a day. It just means regularly to keep up with personal hygiene. If mom can't remember, mom doesn't have capacity. And that's a really hard thing to admit that mm -hmm. my mom can't even remember to shower or she doesn't want to shower for some reason. But we talked about the combative and the apathetic. Right. So sometimes it's combative. I don't need to shower. I showered yesterday. No, mommy, I'm showered in four or five days you really need to take a shower no i don't right and it's hard and it's a it's just a tough situation on that questionnaire um there are some spots where you can say you, you know they say this does the person have capacity and there's yes no or needs assistance i think is what it says or right, on a, yeah on a separate like form yeah so a lot of the times when they when they do like for that needs assistance well if it's to remind them and then there's a fight it's that's really lax capacity right um but you know there's there's all kinds of different ways to handle it and uh, in a lot of my most favorite counties to have this before the clerk they will be doing the hearing and something will come up and you'll have a guardian ad litem did you want to talk about we'll talk about that, that yeah yeah um so the uh, the respondent, or the person in need of guardianship, they go by different names, respondent, ward, I often will say person in need of guardianship, they will be assigned an attorney called a guardian ad litem. And that's kind of like their counsel that they have looking out, making sure that we, the petitioners, are, make, are headed down the right road and we're our goals are not adverse to the respondent's best interest. And, you know, if something comes up during the hearing, we're talking, the clerk will sometimes say, did you guys want to talk about this? And maybe you guys can come up with an idea. It's a very fluid, and I think in the best counties, it's a fluid conversation. It's not a petitioner versus respondent. Because that's not what this is about. This is about the respondent. Right. And there there are some counties that are set up where you have to go into a small, more formal courtroom for these hearings where the clerk is in an on an elevated bench and you know there's actually, you know, that formal witness stand and it can be it can very feel very imposing. But the best clerks, the best deputy clerks that are or assistant clerks that are handling these hearings always make it conversational, very informal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the evidence is still presented and the clerks will still make sure that, you know, the rules of civil procedure are followed because we are talking about someone's rights. But if they can gauge like, okay, no, I, I'm seeing this report from the guardian ad litem. I'm seeing the evidence in front of me and I can tell where we're headed here. Let's make this more 
conversational. Let's make this more comfortable. And then I've had many a guardianship hearing in the clerk's office. They put on the, the hearings on the record. They put the recording on and we just all sit in the office. No one has to get up out of their chair. They still, you know, have sworn testimony, but we're all kind of just sitting around the desk and it feels much more comfortable. It feels much more, we're all trying to do what's best for mom, for yeah. dad, we're for having grandma. a meeting to mm -hmm. make sure that the person in need of guardianship is getting the very best potential outcome that we have the resources for. Right. And you can get into some contested hearings and that's when it'll feel much more formal, but yeah. I'll say what, nine times out of 10, much more just let's get this done, meet our standards and make sure that this person's taken care of. So now we're at the point where we need to file all of the documents that we've been talking about. Well, sometimes that can be e-filed. Some, some of our counties in North Carolina are with file and serve, e-courts, or we're gonna take it to the courthouse. So the next step is how do we let this person in need of guardianship know that there's a hearing now? So when all of the documents are filed, the attorney will fill out what's called a notice of hearing. So that also will appoint a guardian ad litem for your loved one um, that, as Marty had mentioned before, is outside attorney who is charged with representing your loved ones, the respondent's best interests, speaking with them, speaking whoever they, with whoever they need to about what's going on. They make a recommendation to the court and really make sure everyone's on P's and Q's and doing what they should be doing. Um, and the hearing is usually set upon filing all the paperwork for about a month out is what most of our counties are doing, about a month out. If for whatever reason, the attorney has talked to you and said, I think there's something more immediate here. We need to like, get in a little bit quicker. You might hear us talk about what's called interim guardianship. It's a particular motion. And that's when you have a hearing a lot faster probably around 10 days, 10 to 14 days after you filed right. the paperwork. Um, you have that hearing and then the full hearing is still that month out. Um, talk to your attorney before saying this has to happen. Um, you know, in North Carolina, private attorneys don't have emergency guardianship that doesn't exist. I wish it did. I wish it did for a lot of cases, but um, we don't have that. You still have to have a hearing. The guardian ad litem still has to do their investigation and meet with people. Um, so we see 10 to 14 days is about as quick a turnaround as you can get with a private attorney. Now, the state um, and APS have the ability to go for a more emergent guardianship and protective orders. And so that's when you would see, you know, without a hearing, someone has a guardian um, but only the state can do that. And sometimes I know in one case, I made that, that phone call to adult protective services. So you guys need to step in and after explaining it, they sure did. Yeah. And most attorneys will have that relationship with their County to say, you know, um, you know, we really need to consider this and, you know, the County doesn't want to do it. They'll start the process to make sure that someone's protected but usually you're working in tandem and they're like, okay, we're not going to do this forever. The county's not going to be involved forever. Right. But if you guys can get a petition filed, we'll at least get something rolling in the immediate. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can have a good uh, mutually beneficial relationship with your county APS. It doesn't have to be us versus them all the time. Um, so once all of the documents get filed, the guardian ad litem is appointed. Now we've got to talk about service. Um, which gets very touchy for guardianships and incompetencies specifically because how the respondent or the person in need of guardianship has to get these documents, they have to be served by the county sheriff's department. And there is no way around it. There is no, yeah, but let's try this. No. Law says the sheriff, a sheriff's deputy will have to hand them the paperwork um, and you know, there's good reason for it because yeah. they, they need to be notified that this, that someone's trying to say and get a court to agree that you are incompetent and have that rubber stamp that you cannot make decisions for yourself. So of course you want to be notified of that, 
But, you know, when we have situations like we have a person who doesn't understand, um, you know, someone coming in in a uniform can be scary. Uh, and so I try and explain to that person um, that he's on your side. He just wants to give you some papers to tell you about something, but he doesn't want to do it. Yeah, and go through all this mm -hmm. to explain it. And I, I hate it. Right. I wish there was a way we could. Well, you know, I get it. Like, could we just have a plainclothes person right. um, deliver it mm -hmm. to the? But then even part somebody who's laying there in a coma, they're supposed to um, lay it on top of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I that's really not what happens they go to the nurse's desk and say <laughs> you got one a, a one you know whoever this person is a john doe here yeah he's in room such and such not, not awake table. yeah go ahead. <laughs> put it right there yeah so um that's uncomfortable but it happens and we have to do it right and our deputies here in north carolina that do civil process which are it's a it's a specific set of deputies in each department that go and serve civil process papers. They're not looking to arrest people. They're not looking to cause a scene. They just want to hand someone their documents and leave. Right. <laughs> all the day. That's all they want to do. Um, the deputy attests that they have actually served that. Um, the department will send that back to the courthouse. What the attorney or the petitioner will need to do next is by mail, send the same set of documents to um, the next of kin. Our office will usually do certified mail, not with the, you know, the green, the greenback or like the signature required, just certified to say, okay, it got to where we were talking about. Right. It, it was delivered. That's more of a just comfort measure for a lot of us because then we have to file what's called a certificate of service with the court that says all of the next of kin actually got this or we have mailed it. If it gets returned or, you know, something happens, there's remedies for people and there are things we can do, but that's also why we do certified because if it doesn't get delivered, we know, and we're not going to report to the court. Like, yeah, everyone knows when oh, actually brother doesn't know. Um, right. <laughs> we're not going to do that. So that's another reason we'll do certified without the signature required. We just see, yes, okay, it was delivered. I can't make anyone open their mail. Can't make anyone check their mail, mm -hmm. but I can tell the court it was delivered. Not my fault if they didn't check their mail. Right. Right. So so once we have our person in need of guardianship, now they're notified that there is a hearing and how serious it is. Then, assuming there's no interim guardianship hearing, then we wait for the hearing. Um, but sometimes what can happen in between then or it can happen at the hearing and then we get it continued is the court will say, you know, um, or even me, I've done this before. Like, I met with the respondent and um, I'm not sure if, or I've looked at the questionnaire. So not, oftentimes I really don't meet with the respondent um, because there's not a whole lot of interaction I can do with them legally. But uh, I'll look at the questionnaire that we talked about earlier and I'm like, you know, I don't know if we're actually rising to the level or there might be some, mm, are we riding the fence here? So I, well, personally, oftentimes it's the guardian ad litem or the court, but they will order what we call an MDE, and that stands for multidisciplinary evaluation. And all that means is we're going to have three, usually it's three, professionals. This is what they do. They are going to evaluate the person in need of guardianship and in guardian of guardianship and make a recommendation. Do they think that this person meets the criteria to need guardianship. So oftentimes it's a medical doctor will be one of our uh, multi, our, our disciplines that we have evaluate the respondent. Uh, it could be a social worker. And these are the three main ones usually. It's a social worker and a psychologist, sometimes neuropsychologist. They will make a report to the court and say, listen, these are all the findings and it's thick. Uh, and they, Often they're very well done um, and we'll let the court know we do think or we don't or some one of them will, one of them won't, that's fun. Uh, so just so we can make sure the court has all the information they need before they take someone's rights away. Right. And the purpose of it and why you have the multiple disciplines is 
medically, someone could check out totally fine. Medically, someone, you know, seems to be super compliant, seems to understand their treatment as they're meeting with this physician. And, you know, it's like, okay, the medical doctor is like, I'm not, I'm not seeing it here. But then the social worker and the psychologist sit down, they're like, oh no, this person just saw the white coat or knew they were in a doctor's office and was like, I just need to say yes and agree with what the medical doctor is saying. Because we all have that kind of thing. You kind of clam up when you go to the doctor's right. office. You don't want to ask too many questions or all of the questions leave your head. They leave my head. And so then I'm in our por the patient portal asking questions later. But, you know, the social worker and the psychologist are like, no, they had a little bit of white coat syndrome where they were just being a yes man to the doctor. Right. And so the doctor, you know, understandably said, no, I think they're fine. They seem to be compliant with treatment. They seem to understand what's going on. We don't, we don't need to do this. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have multiple disciplines taking a look here. So everyone's got notification of this hearing. The guardian ad litem is starting their work, which is what happens between filing and your hearing. Might be an MDE that's requested, you know, that could happen. But otherwise, between filing and the hearing, what the petitioner's attorney is working on and what the petitioner's working on is making sure there's evidence to present that uh, your loved one needs guardianship. And it can be as much as, you know, a, a medical affidavit, um, testimony from the petitioner or other family members. It, and again, it doesn't, it doesn't always present super formally. Everyone's kind of just go in with, you know, what they know of, of mom, dad, what they, you know, remember how they feel about it, certain things that have happened that made you know, made them want to file this because usually there's a catalyst. There's usually an event, whether it's improper spending, improper medical treatment, not by facilities, but loved one not seeking proper medical treatment, some harm befalling your loved one, something has brought you to court. And so there's usually testimony on that. Um, most of our clients want us to get medical records, <laughs> um, which we try our best all the time. But technically, the facilities are still bound by HIPAA. And so they cannot release protected health information without court orders and things like that. But by law, the guardian ad litem has access to your loved one respondent's medical records. So a lot of times the guardian ad litem will have seen those. They don't always share, but they usually get them for a good basis. Mm -hmm. And I, most of the guardian ad litems that are appointed are excellent. Mm -hmm. And once they get the feeling, you know, each attorney has their own style. I think here at King Law, our style is we need to do what's best for the respondent here. And I think when the guardian ad litem picks up on that, I don't ever have a problem. They don't show me the documents, but they'll say, listen, this is what I'm seeing in the documents. This has happened. There's been an involuntary commitment here and here. Um, I think that it corresponds with what your client says that they're not taking their medications. I think that this the medical records speak to that. So you get an idea. We're in this together to help this respondent get guardianship if it's warranted. Right. And sometimes the the GAL will disagree. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, you have to approach. That's something you have to talk about sometimes. A guardian ad litem can say, there's nothing wrong with your petitioner or client. There's, they have done nothing to this person, but this person is in such a state and believes that your client is not going to treat them well or something. Again, I'm not seeing any evidence to it, but I don't think that it's in the respondent's best interest that your client be guardian yeah like stress they could be stressed out all the time that even if it's a delusion mm -hmm. uh, and not something that is really there or has much teeth that actually happened we're still worried about their best interest and if they're afraid of our client for uh, whatever reason. whatever reason we're not the best ones right and you know sometimes guardians of animals say you know your client's the only option. So I'm kind of begrudgingly saying this. So if I'm kind of talking to your client in such a way that, you know, makes it feel like I'm attacking them, I'm not really trying to. I'm trying to make it clear that the the respondent here has 
has some delusional thinking. The respondent here has some kind of fear. Um, and so good guardians of light and when you have good relationships, you'll talk all of that out. They'll usually call when your petitioner is not going to be the person they recommend as guardian. Um, and then if you don't hear from them <laughs> until the morning of the hearing, that nine times out of 10 is a good sign. Yeah, It means that everything's going smoothly. Everything's going the way you think it is. And their report to the court is going to be handed to you 10 minutes before and just say, yep. yep, I think this person does need a guardian and it should be the petitioner. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. When I haven't heard from the guardian ad litem, I call my client. Have you heard from them like multiple times? Mm -hmm. Because they're going to hear from them so that they can talk to them about it but if they haven't been constantly get, trying to get information from them, I don't think we're good <laughs> <laughs> no news is good news right no news is good news a guardian led will always meet with people at least once or twice mm -hmm. um especially if there's any kind of question or if there's multiple family members involved mm -hmm. um but you know sometimes less is more <laughs> um you know but if you haven't heard from the guardian led litem at all before the hearing that's when we're like, okay, we're going to have to talk about continuing this hearing because I don't think the guardian of the item has had enough time for their investigation. Right. Or sometimes their caseload is so big because mm -hmm. I don't think we have enough. You no, know, we don't. State. So once all of that has started, um, we have a hearing. Um, like we had mentioned, you know, there's a, it's a two-step process here in North Carolina that's kind of all lumped into one. You'll see attorneys in their questioning or going through one phase and then the next phase. Um, I'm the weird attorney who stands up and says, that's all I've got as to incapacity. Um, do you want me to go into what's called best interests, which just means, okay, this is all my evidence that someone doesn't have capacity. Do you want me to go into who the guardian should be? Because technically it's a separate phase. Most clerks are like, yes, that's fine. But I like to delineate. Some clerks say, actually, let's just keep on the incapacity train right now. Let's just get that part done and we can recall everyone later. Right. Right. So once that's done, and you can tell, <laughs> even non-attorneys can tell where this is headed, uh, then the clerk sometimes, if the petitioner's attorney and the guardian ad litem have asked their questions, sometimes the clerk will say, I've got a couple of questions. When you said X, Y, or Z, did you mean this? Or what would you do in this situation? And I'd love that. That means the clerk is really paying attention and wants to get more information. And she, was, she or he is going to make an excellent uh, decision in that case. Right. And I've had the clerks kind of clarify because we all use casual language. All of us mm -hmm. do. And so, you know, um, a good example, I was in a hearing and the the client had said, well, mom was really mean and she, you know, had been mean for a while. And you could kind of pick up from context clues what mean meant. It meant combative. It mm -hmm. meant argumentative. But the clerk just wanted to hear it from the client, from the person testifying that, okay, when you say mean, talk to me about what like, describe what that looks like. You know, is mom hitting you because she's not liking it? Is she yelling at you? Is she stomping around and maybe crying and, you know, just locking herself in a room because she doesn't want to talk about it? Like, what, what does mean mean? <laughs> right. And so you'll have someone kind of expand on that. And that's really because they need to make sure in the record... That, that common language that we all know what it means, we all know what we're talking about here, has been explained. And so the clerk can say, based on that testimony, I'm finding that the respondent lacks capacity. So they're just trying to, you know, button everything up and make sure it's, you know, all clean and the decision's going to be sound. And the clerk uses a level of review i'm sure you've heard that when you're in criminal court to be convicted you know the jury would have to find by uh that there's no or that they're beyond, beyond, beyond reasonable doubt. yeah <laughs> i don't do criminal so that's why i don't remember it uh beyond a reasonable doubt it's like the highest bar because we're taking it could be even taking someone's life at that point uh, well, here it's clear, concise, cogent evidence that this person lacks capacity, which is that's I would say that's just under yes. 
the reasonable doubt. It's the same standard you have to prove if you're going to terminate someone's parental rights, clear, mm-hmm. cogent, convincing evidence. Um, so it's a it's a higher standard. It's not as high as a criminal standard, but it's a higher standard than just, you know, what we call preponderance of the evidence, which is 50 percent plus a feather. I <laughs> love saying that. Your husband <laughs> says that and I use that all the time. Well, our professor always says oh, that. Oh, is that where you got 50 percent plus a feather. Because um, I say it all the time. They're like, well, that's good. Thank you, Johnny Crisco, for living in our brain. Um, (laughs) And now it lives in mine, and I thought it was your husband that coined it. 50% plus a feather. Well, we're higher than that in guardianship land. So once the hearing's over, the clerk will verbally make a decision whether or not someone lacks capacity. And usually at that time, we'll also say, and upon application, I will appoint... X and usually it's hopefully your client, um, right? And that's when you would then move into the next phase of you know applying to be a guardian. Sometimes there's a few different requirements which we'll get into other into in other videos, um, and you know hopefully just be on the road to you know taking care of your loved one. Yeah. Thank you for joining us today and listening to Marty and I ramble on about guardianships. If you have any. If you have any questions or want to see any of our other videos, we are on multiple platforms, um, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast. Um, And if you ever need to speak to one of our attorneys, whether myself, Marty, or one of our fabulous team here, feel free to schedule a, reach out to schedule a consultation um, through our client services team. Phone number is 828-286-3332. Thank you.